subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect severe injustice and they should be stopped we should raise our voices condemn this uh, brutal act civil society has been decimated Welcome you to the fifth annual SAT conference. Uh, this year we are holding it virtually. I thank you for joining us uh, on behalf of my co-convener, Ambassador Sana Pani, and uh, every other uh, colleague who has contributed to holding previous sessions and this particular one. And as has been customary, um, I'll open with a couple of uh, verses. Abohi harfe junu. सबकी जुबा ठहरी है अब वही हर्फ जुनू सबकी जुबा ठहरी है जो भी चल निकली है वो बात कहा ठहरी है हमने जो तर्ज फगा की है कफस में ईजाद हमने जो तर्ज फगा की है कफस में ईजाद फैज गुलशन में वही तर्ज बयान ठहरी है सो दिस इज आर सिक्स conference that uh, we are convening together to talk about how uh, to change things uh, in our homeland pakistan although uh, this is a south asian forum but our primary focus and uh, primary membership is uh, people and uh, nationalities and uh, others who come from pakistan uh, when we started our sat forum overall uh, we got a lot of flack uh, basically for saying things which were considered either unpopular or we were seen as unpatriotic uh, treasonous seditious doing it on behalf of uh, this that or the other foreign foreign power uh our we maintained that historically pakistan has had two different world views competing world views one presented by the pakistan army and the other presented by the pakistani politicians dating all the way back to field marshal ayub khan when he took over uh, by force at the barrel of gun uh, the country's polity and was challenged by none other than mohtarma fatima jinnah who was assisted by khan abdul wali khan khair bakhsh khan mari and many other of our political elders at that time so we have always maintained that there is essentially a competing world view uh, that the pakistan army has held and they have framed the narrative of patriotism according to that and anyone that does not fit the bill has been ostracized as rebellious treasonous or uh, in worst case scenario even as blasphemous तो अब जो सूरत हाल पाकिस्तान के अंदर पैदा हो रही है वो इतनी खुशाइंद है कि बयान से बाहर है हम जो बात इतने अरसे से करते चले आ रहे हैं हमारा मतम नजर यही था कि पाकिस्तान की सियासी कवतों को उठकर अपना किरदार अदा करना चाहिए और वो किरदार सिर्फ हुकूमत बनाने और चलाने पर मबनी नहीं है बल्कि एक ऐसी अवेयरनेस पैदा की जाए कि पाकिस्तान के जो मसाइल हैं उनकी बुनियाद और जड़ तक पहुंचा जाए तो पिछले चंद हफ्तों में जो कुछ हमने सुना और देखा वो हमारे कानों के लिए तो बड़ी एक मौसीकी है मगर बहरहाल एक सियासी पार्टियों और सियासी कवतों के अंदर भी एक तब्दीली जो है वो नजर आ रही है ये होना तो बहुत पहले चाहिए था और होते चले जाना चाहिए था मगर वो अभी तक हुआ नहीं था 
और बिलखसूस उन सियासी पार्टियों की जानब से नहीं हुआ था जो पंजाब के अंदर अपना पावर बेस रखती हैं जाहिर है कि पाकिस्तान का सबसे बड़ा सूबा है और जो लोग पाकिस्तान आर्मी के नरेटिव को चैलेंज करते चले आ रहे थे वो या छोटे सूबों से ताल्लुक रखते थे या अगर पंजाब से भी ताल्लुक रखते थे तो वो अदी तौर पर कम मेजॉरिटी रखने वाली पार्टियों से उनका ताल्लुक था अब जबकि पाकिस्तान की सबसे बड़ी पार्टी के खाए जो कि पाकिस्तान के तीन बार वजीर अजम रह चुके हैं वो बात कह रहे हैं कि जो हम इस फोरम से बार बार कहते चले आ रहे हैं तो हम समझते हैं कि हमने कुछ काम अभी तक ठीक ही किया है बुनियादी तौर पे व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट इन दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस ओवर द नेक्स्ट टू डेज विल बी डिवाइडेड इन फोर सेशंस वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द स्टेट ऑफ द पाकिस्तानी सोसाइटी एंड स्टेट we're going to talk about sectarianism uh, minorities uh, and uh, the religious uh, entities which are under threat and under fire we are going to talk about the curbs on freedom of expression we are going to talk about missing persons and disappearances but the overarching theme that we have is uh, going to be civilian supremacy and how the lopsided civil military balance in pakistan over the years has been actually at the root cause of the problems that our country and society faces pretty much every issue uh, eventually dovetails into those lopsided civil military relations and the military's world view uh, and when i say military i essentially mean the pakistan army's top brass uh, we have heard about the doctrines uh, now and we had heard about uh, certain uh, papers written by previous chief of staffs but it all eventually goes back to uh, 1958 when uh, general ayub khan took power and essentially formulated that uh, the pakistani state is going to be a national security state where uh, the pakistan army gets to decide what the grand norm uh, of the country would be as against the constitution uh, the civilian view put forward at that time by hussain shaikh sorwardi and many others including bali khan and badshah khan and Uh, the baloch uh, triumvirate has been that we need to be a federal democratic state based upon the principles of democracy freedoms of expression and civil liberties enshrined in the constitution uh, over the years we have seen that uh, army has ruled either directly or indirectly but by very minimal tweaking of the same formula that ayub khan had presented holding a fig leaf of civilian democracy or uh, legitimacy in front while ruling ruling uh, through the barrel of the gun and what we have currently in pakistan is essentially another tedious repetition of the tired canard that we have heard over and over again that somehow if the military and the so called civilian dispensation are on the same page there will be uh, a everything will be hunky dory uh, and milk and honey will flow but what we have noticed is that these experiments have failed time and again we keep hearing about a uh, presidential model uh, even now uh, we hear about that unfortunately all of these things have been tried and tested and actually been tried and tested on the military's watch 34 years under presidential slash martial law rule has actually taken us from one disaster to the other so we convene uh, every year and periodically in between to deliberate and actually uh, act as a clearing house for information for ideas and uh, say things which are unpopular at the time but our fundamental belief has been that dissent is the highest form of patriotism saying things which are unpopular but in our view and in our uh, considered opinion and collective opinion are things that can improve the state of pakistani society and state have to be said whether it is unpopular whether it is something that uh, uh, we get dissed for we get smeared for and uh, we have also noted over the years that people uh, in their diaspora or in self exile or uh, Uh, otherwise in in certain uh, situations who uh, may not physically be uh, in pakistan 
uh, also have a responsibility and uh, actually an opportunity to uh, say things which are harsh and give a reality check. Uh, we have been actually taunted for speaking from America and London and uh, Fala, uh, but uh, historically, uh, uh, exile is the legacy uh, of uh, prophets and philosophers and activists uh, and uh, essentially greats of the political history. Uh, people went on train from Zurich to uh, St. Petersburg and uh, ended up uh, succeeding there. People went from, uh, from London to uh, Pakistan and back. Uh, it is uh, never uh, the question of uh, being physically where uh, one is, but actually where one's heart is. Uh, with this, um, I'm just going to uh, keep it short and sweet and uh, basically pass on uh, to my uh, uh, co-panelists and moderators. Uh, Annie, Annie Zaman uh, is going to be our moderator for the first session and we have a great lineup of uh, speakers and uh, uh, we have keynote speakers for today and tomorrow, and uh, Ambassador Hakani is going to conclude uh, today's uh, second session. Uh, with, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, request um, Annie to uh, moderate the first session in which we are going to talk about sectarianism, state of the minorities, uh, uh, religious uh, plurality or lack thereof, and uh, impact on regions, uh, the uh, various uh, nations and nationalities that comprise the Federation of Pakistan. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taki. I hope everyone is hearing me well and uh, I would continue our first session, the state of sectarianism and minorities in Pakistan. Uh, thank you so much for everyone once again for joining us today from different uh, time zones and giving us your time. Many of us, we know, who are working today as well, but have taken this time out. So uh, in this uh, panel, we announced uh, many uh, speakers. Uh, I would first like to uh, pass on regrets from uh, Ms. Faranaz Sahani, who's former member of the parliament, and uh, she cannot uh, participate today with us. Uh, but I would like to take on uh, our conversation from her thesis, from her book, if I'm, I'm sure most of you have read it here, but I would like to repeat something from there and take our conversation uh, further ahead. In Farah's book, uh, Purifying the Land of the Pure, History of Pakistan's Religious Minorities, she basically her thesis is that she uh, puts blames on uh, Pakistan's military and the devil uh, or the evil figure in this whole um, sectarianism and uh, the situation of minorities is those military men who turned into politics. So I would like to uh, talk to my panelists today. We have Marvi Sarmad, um, who's a journalist and human rights defender and executive council member of Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. Then we have Jaffa Mirza, who's a UK-based researcher and columnist, and Tahira Jabin from Gilgit, Baltistan, which is a very important uh, uh, province right now for Pakistan. And uh, there's lots of things happening and we are already in the sixth day of a protest in Hinza. Then uh, Joha from uh, Pashtun Global, uh, Pashtun Council Canada, she's representing them. And uh, I would like to start off from Jaffa, Jaffa Mirza. The Jaffa, uh, you have written extensively about state of uh, minorities, particularly Shias. So if you would like to throw some light, like what's happening in 2020 in Pakistan with Shias who are the uh, apparently the biggest minority uh, sect in Pakistan. Um, thank you so much, and, and thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity to speak about um, the pressing issue, which is a recent wave of anti-Shia politics. And since I have very limited time, I would directly give a summary of recent events where Shias were the main target, and would discuss and analyze why the current wave is dangerous and could leave long-lasting implications for religious coexistence in Pakistan. So I would not go into detail about the Shia Sunni conflict. Uh, time doesn't allow me. So directly coming to my topic, uh, we don't have exact data how many Shias have been killed in Pakistan. One estimate suggests that there are around 22,000 Shias have been killed since 1968. And particularly since the new PTI government came into power, more than 35 Shias have been killed and at least 60 were injured. 
I also want to add that the Shias are the first minority who have started witnessing enforced disappearances of their community members. According to one estimate, there are 33 Shias missing, including women, are missing across Pakistan. The abducted Shias are accused of fighting Syria and Iraq. However, the authorities have failed to produce any evidence in courts. And just yesterday, uh, police picked up six women in, in Narobad for participating in Jhelum procession. Um, coming to the recent situation, um, Karachi has witnessed at least four big anti-Shia rallies since September 11, held by different mainstream as well as proscribed organizations. And, and since August 30, uh, at least five Shias have been killed in different parts of Pakistan on sectarian basis. More than 30 blasphemy cases have been registered against Shias. At least one religious congregation was attacked and several videos appeared in which Shias were forced to accept the majority historical account. On social media, hashtags like Shia Kafir were also trending. And as now I'm speaking, an anti-Shia trend is happening on Twitter as well. We have also seen uh, recently that the, the Hafuz Islam bill, which, which basically imposes a majority view of the first three caliphs on Shias. And we keep in mind that Muawiya Azam Tariq, the son of former Sipa Sahaba head Azam Tariq, played a key role in proposing the bill. So the bill is an attempt to institutionalize anti-Shia politics. And there were demands to ban Shia processions, which are central to Shia belief and cultural practices. So these tactics are one way of using non-violent, but coercive way to legally sanction anti-Shia hate. Historically, the anti-Shia violence was predominantly occupied by the Obandi and Ahle Hadith groups until the emergence of Barelbis, who constitute majority in Pakistan. The biggest anti-Shia rally in Karachi was organized by, by Barelbis on September 12th, which signals that the silent majority is now claiming the space from Deobandis and Salafis and are now turning against Shias. For Barelvis, who were, limit to, who were limited to anti-Ahmadiyya and anti-Christian politics, the anti-Shia stance is an opportunity not only to stay relevant for their followers, but to negotiate with the state over, over power sharing by replacing Deobandi and Salafis groups. My concern is, which I've also discussed in my recent write-up, that Barelvis have been a buffer between Shias and Sunni hardliners. It is Shias and Barelvis who mostly interact with each other on a daily basis. This means that the recent arrival of Barelvis in the anti-Shia bandwagon signals dis a disruption in the harmonious relationship that did not only contain groups like Sepa Sahaba, but also accommodated religious coexistence between Shias and Sunnis. By radicalizing Barelvis, the state has left Shias with no allies and, and made them more vulnerable to face violence from three main religious groups. I mean, I understand few argue that the state is in complete control of these groups and can neutralize whenever the establishment wants. So we, know, we don't need to panic. I agree that the state controls these groups and use them to unleash violence as a, as a pressure tactic. But I would say, the state cannot undo its policy overnight. I mean, the Afghan intervention is a perfect example. We can see the repercussions it has on the society. The narrative on jihad the state promoted it still haunts Pakistan. It, it, it actually affected ordinary people. Even if the state decides to eliminate TLP or Khadim Rizvi, that's not enough. Now, Barelvis have also realized that the violence is a way to get recognition and being relevant in religious political sphere. More importantly, the state does not have any mechanism to undo anti-minority hate in Pakistan because it requires a change in mindset, in curriculum, and in public discourse where you acknowledge the presence of minorities, their contribution, and celebrate diversity as a strength. On the contrary, the state has almost erased a memory and historical account in which minorities were once an important stakeholder. I would end by saying that what it seems that under the state patronage, the two mainstream groups will compete to claim the space by suppressing weaker religious groups and minorities. And this process will happen at the grassroots level, which would make religious coexistence even more difficult for Shias and other minorities. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jafar uh, Mirza. Um, I would like to uh, take the conversation uh, further and uh, would like to raise this question to uh, Marvi. Uh, I think I should bring... Uh, we have Tahira Jabin here. 
human rights activist from Gilgit, Baltistan. I would like to ask her that is this uh, state's uh, repression only towards religious minorities or also like small uh, 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 provinces? It's a, I think it's a totally wrong uh, word to say that, uh, call uh, any province small, but that's what Pakistani uh, uh, establishments uh, uh, narrative had had been uh, since 1977, and as uh, uh, I talked earlier about the thesis which I'm making uh, base for this uh, session. Uh, so, uh, is it has anything changed since like uh, 1988, or um, in uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan? And what's happening there now? Uh, Tahira, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Annie. Um, if we for the last five six days, um, in the in the mountains of Himalayas, in northern in northern areas previously called northern areas, not Gilgit Baltistan, there are women, men, children, families, elderly, all of them are sitting for the last six days in that harsh weather conditions, demanding for the release of political prisoners and uh, their voices are being echoed within those you know un se those majestic mighty mighty mountains se takra takra ke apne unko wapas unke apne kaanon mein goonj rahe there is nobody uh, who is hearing them there is nobody who is echoing them there is nobody who is lending their voice to this um, to these protesting people and um, state policies state policies um, gilgit baltistan is 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 an example where pakistan exerted all its colonial um, authorities and you know mechanisms to oppress us uh, in return, what we gave, what we uh, what we gave to Pakistan 73 years ago. Going back to the protest, um, my my focus today will be uh, talking about the protest in Hunza, who these people are, why these people are protesting. Uh, historically, if you see that people of Hunza are quite apolitical. Being myself from Hunza, unfortunately, uh, that's how we are like uh, groomed because um, we were kept uh, in isolation and from the mainstream politics. So uh, we do not have that kind of a political development. We do not maintain that, that seasoned political opinion about issues. We have so much polarization within ourselves. Apart from those all points, these, these people, including Baba Jan, the people are protesting for their release are the ones who stood up for the people. In, 19, in 2010, uh, there was a landslide and 25 valleys in Hunza, uh, 12 valleys in Hunza and 25 valleys uh, came uh, came under the 25 kilometers of area came under water and it blocked the mountains fall down and it blocked the river and tamam <clears throat> valleys wo ho gayi doob gayi 25 kilometers ka ilaqa doob gaya and pakistan military did not uh, like you know, spillways, they literally allow the whales to drown. They literally allow our areas to area to drown in the water. Then what happened? Like thousands of people became homeless. They became IDPs within their own homes. And uh, without any compensation, without any state like uh, attention towards them. Uh, first, uh, there were cracks. They were there. They knew this is going to happen because of the earthquake. Pura mountain crack ho gaya tha. Everyone knew that this is the, the disaster was in store. Nobody took a precautionary measures. Nothing was done. And then on, on, on to to rub the salt on the on the wound when when this this, this disaster stuck. Then uh, people died, people became homeless, and then compensation was not paid to the people. No, they were not even registered for the compensation. So uh, these, in, in during the government of Pakistan People's Party in 2011, uh, Mehdi Shah went to, to Hunza for, for, a, for a public gathering or something. And uh, the, those families were protesting and Baba Jan being a, being a human rights advocate, uh, um, practicing a left politics, he led these protests. He led these protests, and um, they demanded for uh, demanded for the comp compensation, uh, resettlement, and rehabilitation of these ITPs, and uh, then. Um, Police opened fire on them. In the the peaceful protesters were dispersed through violent means, and uh, a father and a son um, 
got martyrdom uh, in in uh, during that uh, firing and uh, baba jan uh, together with other uh, four uh, 14 uh, uh, companions they led this struggle they protested they demanded and what happened to them those political those, those peaceful protesters were charged with sedition tyranny they were tried in military courts and they were given life imprisonments anti-terrorism charges this guy he, with others and their families are up their children they have small children they are poor families they are growing their families their children are growing without fathers they are their economic situation is miserable their family situation is miserable so gilgit baltistan ek to mehroom rakha gaya for the last 73 years wo ek mehroomi apni jagah but ehsaas e mehroomi is also killing us you know so ye uh, the problem is kyunki hum log political kisi process ka hissa nahi rahe hain to is wajah se external forces ye digital jo it hai technology hai iski wajah se thodi sa shaur aa raha hai but not that shaur that like uh, that gives us like ek uh, hum ek point one point agenda pe pura pura gilgit baltistan ikatta ho Okay, hum log one voice ho jayen. So, ye nahi hai. But there is so much polarization. But what I was saying that so much is happening in Gilgit Baltistan. So much oppression. So much uh, state ka jo hai na hamare khilaf anti anti locals policy, sectarianism hai, militarism hai. Bahut kuch ho raha hai wahan pe. The problem jo which is which is more concerning, which is killing us, the silence of people like yourself i am sorry how many of you how many of you have tweeted for the people of gilgit baltistan how many of you have said that free baba jan free political prisoners of gilgit baltistan so um, sorry okay uh, thank you so much shukriya uh, tahira uh, first of all on behalf of a sat forum and all the participants i would like to formally uh, extend our support and solidarity towards uh, Baba Jan and other political prisoner right now in uh, prison. And also our support to thousands of people of Gilgit Baltistan who are right now from the last six days sit uh, like uh, on the streets and protesting against the current government of Prime Minister Imran Khan. From there, I would like to uh, come to our uh, third speaker, Joha, who also represents a uh, um, uh, again, you know, it's a very uh, wrong way to present, but again, a very strong, uh, uh, movement, uh, uh, Pashtun Tahfuz movement, and our Pashtun friends uh, uh, who are um, in um, uh, uh, in the U.S. and uh, she is actually uh, in Canada, Pashtun Council Canada, and she's going to represent and tell us that uh, what's the situation with them. We have been following it, and uh, Pashtun Tahfuz uh, movement and their leaders they have made the headlines and they have been on the forefront. And what's the uh, what's happening now? We see. Uh, the movement or uh, the demands or the charter which were presented from them not going ahead. What's happening? Uh, is it uh, we, uh, we who are not listening or uh, they are not talking? Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Sat Forum. This is the dialogue and mobile phone. And today, we have a conference with the five people. Our other people have been talking about this. But in the case of the کہ اس موضوع پر بات کرنے والوں کو پاکستان میں ہمیشہ تنقید کا نشانہ بنایا جاتا ہے گزشتہ سات ستر تریتر سالوں سے اس ملک کی زندگی کا زیادہ تر حصہ عین اور دستور فوجی امریت کے بوٹ تلے گزرا ہے عوامی رائے کو کبھی بھی دل سے تسلیم نہیں کیا گیا اور اداروں کو کبھی بھی کام کرنے نہیں دیا گیا جمہوریت کو پولیٹیکل انجینئرنگ اور الیکشنس کو داندیوں کی وجہ سے متنازع بنا دیا گیا جس کے نتیجے میں پاکستان ٹوٹ گیا اور کسی نے ابھی بھی ہوش کے ناخن نہیں لیے تو ابھی اور ابھی بھی اسی سلسلے کا ابھی بھی اسی پالیسیوں کا سلسلہ جاری ہے پاکستان بنیادی طور پر پانچ بڑی قومیتوں کا فیڈریشن ہے اور پنجاب کے علاوہ باقی قوموں کو محکوم رکھا جا رہا ہے اور قومیتوں کو اور بھی تقسیم کرنے کی کوشش کی جا رہی ہے کبھی پر خیاریت کے نام پہ کبھی لسانی بنیادوں پر مزید تقسیم کیا جا رہا ہے بنیادی انسانی حقوق نہ ہونے کے برابر ہے جو کوئی بھی بنیادی انسانی حقوق کی بات کرتا ہے اسے یا تو غائب کیا جاتا ہے یا قتل کر دیا جاتا ہے اور یا پھر غدار قرار دیا جاتا ہے 
پشتونوں کی انٹیلیجنسیا کو ایک منظم طریقے سے ٹارگیٹ کیا جا رہا ہے آپ نے پی ٹی ایم کی بات کی ہے پروفیسر ارمان لونے کو شہید کیا گیا ابھی ریسنٹلی پروفیسر اسماعیل کو ہی از بینگ ٹارچر آن فالس اینڈ فیبریکیٹ کیس دوسرا پروفیسر جو ہے ڈاکٹر نعیم کو برقیوریت کے نام پر قتل کیا گیا اسی طرح بلوچوں سندھیوں سارے محکوم قوموں کو نشانہ بنایا جا رہا ہے اس ریاست کے سارے محکوم قوم جو ہیں وہ ایک معاہد عین کے تحت رضامندی سے اس ریاست میں رہ رہے ہیں ویسے آپ قوموں کو زیادہ دیر تک جبر اور زبردستی سے محکوم نہیں رکھ سکتے اس رویوں کو بدلنا ہوگا آپ نے پی ٹی ایم کی بات کی ہے پی ٹی ایم دے آر جسٹ ڈیمانڈنگ بیسک ہیومن رائٹس اس کو ہر لحاظ سے وہاں پر نشانہ بنایا جا رہا ہے دو سالوں سے اس نے جو ڈیمانڈ کی ہے پانچ اس کو ابھی تک حل نہیں کیے ہیں اور اس پر ابھی بھی تشدد کیا جا رہا ہے ایسے رویوں کو بدلنا ہوگا اور اس ملک کو ایک حقیقی جمہوری ملک بنانا ہوگا تھینک یو سو مچ بہت بہت شکریہ آپ کا کہ آپ نے اتنے تھوڑے وقت میں ہمیں ایک بہت ہی پرسائز طریقے سے سارا بتایا اب آئی وڈ لائک ٹو تھینک آل آف آر اسپیکرز اینڈ گو فردر to uh, Marvi Sarmad, who is journalist and human rights defender and also executive council member of Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, which uh, I might not be wrong by saying it's one of the few independent voices left in the country when it comes to development sector or those organizations which are lobbying or are doing advocacy around uh, how important democracy is for Pakistan uh, right now. Uh, rather than going back towards like 1977 or 1988, God forbid we are, you know, uh, going backwards and there are not many uh, strong organizations left. So I would like to come to Marvi and say that I uh, would like to ask her what's uh, the new statistics and new uh, report of Human Rights Commission stating about the, the state of min uh, minorities and uh, sectarianism in Pakistan. Well, thank you very much, Annie. Uh, thanks a lot for um, the beautiful way you introduced me. Uh, it's a privilege to be among such an uh, amazing bunch of intellectuals and activists and experts uh, and speaking at this forum. Uh, uh, since the establishment of uh, SAAD Forum in 2016, I've had the privilege of uh, participating every single event uh, and the conference that was organized by SAAD. Uh, I've been speaking at this forum ever since uh, uh, its establishment. And, uh, but, but when I look back and try to hear myself, I feel I've been frustratingly repetitive in telling you what all of you already know, uh, in, in highlighting the problems. I mean, you are, you, are, you are speaking of the HRCP report. All of you have already read that report. Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, in, in Pakistani media, it was widely covered. People of Pakistan know what kind of um, uh, problems they are facing. Um, minorities know uh, how they are being suppressed. Uh, the media keeps highlighting uh, in a careful and controlled way, uh, whatever, and social media, all of you are so much vocal and so much uh, you are loud, best voices in Pakistan, and I feel really privileged to be among you guys. Uh, in highlighting the problems um, with Pakistan's skewed democratic culture, the, uh, the challenges posed by our so-called civil military balance that is heavily and apparently irrevocably uh, tilted towards uh, the military, I'm a bit tired of trying to sing to the choir you know, of stating the obvious, of, of screaming out, uh, out of pain, anger, sheer frustration, uh, of depicting the pain that an exploitative system has inflicted upon every group, every group uh, in our society that is perceived to be weak, be it gender minorities, be it ethnic minorities, religious, sectarian, or ideological minorities like ourselves, all of us, we also are minorities. I would posit the case of a society that is undergoing total breakdown and fast approaching its eventual collapse. But 
in all probability, I would still keep highlighting all of the above mentioned um, the problems and challenges. Please bear with me if I digress a bit. Um, we have an excellent lineup of speakers uh, throughout today and tomorrow. And um, as uh, uh, worthy speakers before me um, have done and uh, the next speakers are expected to uh, to do um, to deal with the subjects in detail um, about the various challenges that Pakistan's democracy faces as of today. Uh, that makes me a bit, uh, um, you know, at liberty to to wander around and have a deeper look at what we are actually uh, trying to do. While a predominant section of media and probably of the society as well thinks uh, that. Uh, uh, we, we, we are doing some propaganda against the country and, uh, and we are anti-Islam and we are anti-Pakistan and blah, blah, blah. I will not tell you why few hours ago today, people of Gilgit Baltistan were staging protest uh, demonstration in Islamabad. I won't be able to tell you why the state of Pakistan has been keeping Gilgit Baltistan activists in jail for a decade now. Why the survivors of, of Atabad Lake tragedy are still fighting for their right to mere survival, mere survival. I mean, I, I won't be telling you why the parents of the children brutally slain in the APS massacre have not been provided justice as yet. Why the rape and gang rape cases are being dealt, dealt with like they are being dealt with. Why even two years old girl and boys are raped and killed all over the country. Why Christian and Hindu girls are easy victims of rape covered as forced conversions uh, to Islam. I won't be able to tell you why systematic genocide of Ahmadi and Shia Muslims constitute, uh, 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 it, it, um, uh, it, it continues with impunity and what role the state has played in bringing that bloodshed to our homes. Why Sindhi and Baloch nationalists are being abducted, tortured, and killed in, 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 while in custody by the security agencies? Why enforced disappearances have become a norm while perpetrators enjoy full and absolute immunity? Why ideological minorities like yourselves and myself are considered anti-Pakistan or anti-Islam? Why they are demonized and dehumanized? Why Aurat March and, Aurat March and actually um, even a slightest image of a woman uh, is, is considered obscene and counter to so-called Pakistani culture, whatever that means. Why freedom of expression is totally stifled to the point where whatever comes from the mainstream media feels like concocted, engineered, and uh, in fact, an alternative truth coined by the all-powerful military establishment. Why the political parties and leaders are target of McCarthyist style uh, uh, campaigns? Why and how electoral process and the parliament have been made absolutely inconsequential, despite all those fancy electoral reforms that the politicians brought together in 2017? Why democracy is suddenly a bad word during any discussion, any discussion, anywhere in Pakistan about efficient governance. Why economy has been hijacked by the establishment and the politicians have been left to shoulder the burden for, uh, for, for this depression. I wouldn't tell you why a sexual harassment accused is being celebrated by media while he coerces the key witnesses with the help from FIA, yes, FIA, Federal Investigation Agency, at the behest of reportedly the ruling party and the ISPR. I won't cheer up men who led the APC and cheered a patriarch for saying no more to the military establishment's antics. I would appreciate that, but I won't cheer that. In the seven minutes that are about to end, in fact, uh, I would only be able to leave some questions for you. I would just ask you, do you or don't you see any workable democracy requiring its citizens and representatives think not only as I, but also as we. Do you believe that this we should include she or anyone who does not want to be categorized as she or he? Uh, are we advocating a democracy that musters votes from majority in order to make government and then pander to the interests of that majority? 
should we discuss deliberative democracy or discursive democracy in which um, uh, deliberations um, uh, and discussions are central to decision making? where the system adopts the elements of both consensus decision making and uh, the, the majority rule. Uh, I mean, it's democracy essentially should not be tyranny of majority. Should authentic deliberation, not mere voting, I mean, deliberations is not just voting. Should this, this kind of deliberation is the primary, uh, be the primary source of legitimacy for the law or not? Democracy, as I see, involves public discussion of common problems, not just a silent counting of individual heads. Indeed, it bets the, uh, the, the, the democrat, uh, uh, democratic process involves um, uh, and uh, involves the resolution of conflict, not only by majority will, but by, uh, by discovering uh, answers that integrate the interests of minorities. So the deliberative democracy model does not simply register um, preferences um, that individuals already have. Uh, it encourages, I think, citizens, all citizens in a collective to think about their interests differently, if they deem so. And when I see it with a uh, you know, with my different eye, which is a feminist eye, I find myself completely removed from what is considered mainstream or hardcore politics. This is this is a place where even women um, uh, who are there have to lay off the interests intrinsically bound to their gender identity, completely divorce them. I was glad to see some women in APC uh, that was held recently. However, there were th these women were displayed as 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 um so to say uh, supporting actors um uh, uh, in uh, in a cast of a uh, of a box office hit uh, mariam nawashiri was probably the only woman who got a seat on the head of the table that too because of being the daughter of of a patriarch we are told that accepting an anti feminist exclusive believer of religious autocracy as the lead of this APC or the whatever movement is a strategic need of the hour. I understand. I understand the pressures of the time. I understand why many comrades are, are willing to accept it, uh, though grudgingly, I believe. I also understand why many women have to divorce feminist agenda in order to survive in the boys club that this, this uh, so-called mainstream politics has become, has been for so long, in fact. And that is why I just want to mark few lines and few goalposts. No APC can succeed. No democracy can be established without addressing the ob obvious uh, societal collapse and the fall of a complex human society that is characterized in Pakistan by, uh, by, by uh, the loss of cultural identity, uh, uh, socio-political, uh, socio-economic complexity, the downfall of the will of the people and the rise of violence that is overseen and at many times, many points, perpetrated by the state, not only overseen, but perpetrated by the state. Virtually all civilizations have suffered this fate, regardless of size of complex complexity. We are not even a civilization, I'm sorry to inform you. To address this in my not very humble opinion, class consciousness is not enough. We must try to understand these concepts of class consciousness and how they work in, uh, in relation to our um, a peculiar history that is peculiar to us. I would posit gender is the most important identity. However intersectional it is, howsoever people pick and mix their identities, this is a key part of a functioning democratic culture. So while we present our accolades to the political patriarchs for standing up uh, to a far stronger patriarch that military establishment is, I would like to side with the uh, uh, with the Ambedkars uh, and Bhagat Singhs of the time, rather than Gandhis or the Nehru's or even the Jinnahs, whose politics perpetuated the class oppression and systematic exploitation and the communalism that we see in South Asia today. 
it is painful to report to you that Pakistan, unfortunately, is no Babylon or Mesopotamia. That, uh, that, that would be remembered hundreds of years after its collapse. But, uh, and, and living through the legacy of their intellectual and technological advances. As they say, I'm so sorry to say, but I would end um, with this. Tumhari tak thi na hogi and for, for, the, for the liberal uh, dissenters, it is very important to recognize what is strategic, what is ideological, and I'm not ready to divorce my ideology for strategy. Um, I understand why you have to do that. I would support you in that, but I will uh, very clearly demarcate my boundaries there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Marvi, for uh, including. Um, uh, first, you know, you uh, very nicely explained. Uh, by, uh, by not answering, you gave so many answers to us that uh, where what what is the state of uh, sectarianism and minorities, and very nicely you have also covered uh, gender minorities in Pakistan, which many times we uh, tend to forget to highlight issues that are. Um, um, surrounded around that and what is the gender politics in Pakistan which is quite obvious but we shy away to discuss it. Thank you so much uh, all the participants uh, and I would like to wrap on a um, I don't know uh, I'm I'm not a pessimist by nature so I think I'm looking at Hunza and PDM and the struggle of Gulala Ismail who's uh, uh, we are very uh, uh, grateful that she's here and uh, her father is struggling back home so these people are hopes and what they say is like we are seeds, you know. Um, so all of us, I think, Sats should be named as seeds, maybe at some point later on. To uh, <laughs> thank you so much, and uh, uh, for uh, I would like to wrap it up now. Our second session is about uh, the state of media in Pakistan, and it would be uh, uh, moderated by Marvi. So I will mute myself and thank everyone for their participation and their. Uh, expert opinions about the uh, state of minorities and sectarianism in Pakistan. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Miras, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about the elections uh, ke announcement ki hai par abhi, uh, next month. Ki. और उसके बाद आप क्या एक्सपेक्ट कर रही हैं कि क्योंकि मेरी कुछ लोगों से बात हो रही थी मैंने अभी रिसेंटली एक पीस भी किया था इसके हवाले से कि गिलगित बल्तिस्तान में जो उसको प्रोविंशियल स्टेटस पे लेके जाया जा रहा है उसमें चाइना का कितना हाथ है और लोकल डायनामिक्स क्या है और जो मुझे नजर आया वो ये था कि जो वहां पर लोकल जो लोग हैं वो थोड़े से इस इस तरफ अब देखते हैं कि एटलीस्ट जो एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव लिम्बो है या जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल लिम्बो है वो खत्म होगा हमें कुछ स्टेटस मिलेगा तो लोकल्स में क्या इस वक्त उनका सेंटिमेंट है इस जो जो अभी गवर्नमेंट अनाउंस किया है इस हवाले से थैंक यू तहा इलेक्शंस इन गिलगित बल्तिस्तान आर ऑलवेज हाईजैक्ड बाय द फेडरल गवर्नमेंट इसमें तो कोई शक नहीं है सो व्हाट हैपेंस इज व्हेन इलेक्शंस आर अनाउंस्ड इन गिलगित बल्तिस्तान वेयर इज वेयर देयर इज अ नेशनल गवर्नमेंट तो क्या होता है कि उसका डायरेक्टली इम्पेक्ट होता है गिलगित बल्तिस्तान के इलेक्शंस पे सो so, ये एक प्रैक्टिस uh, रही है कि जिसकी भी फेडरल में गवर्नमेंट होती है बाय डिफॉल्ट इसकी गवर्नमेंट आ जाती है गिलगित बल्तिस्तान में तो जो व्हाट पीटीआई इज डूइंग एट द मोमेंट थ्रू वो क्या कर रहे हैं कि वो मेकिंग एंड ब्रेकिंग कर रहे हैं वो दे आर टेकिंग आउट नो पीपल पोलिटिशंस फ्राम पी एम एल एंड मोस्टली एंड दे आर ब्रिंगिंग इट इन टू पी एंड देन forming their team and they are um, they are um, they have started their electioneering campaign your 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 um, point towards what people are feeling so as i said earlier there is a extremely polarized opinion kyunki logon ko kuch log kehte hain ki kuch bhi mil jaye thoda bahut bhi mil jaye to hum hamara chal jayega but people like myself are, are like we are saying that uh, we uh, okay we are open for integration we are ready for the integration there should be a uh, uh, there should be a provincial kind of a status but there should be a groundwork ground वर्क में जो हमारे लो, जो लोकल लोग हैं उन लोगों का इंटरेस्ट जो है ना वो सेफ गार्ड हो वो मेन स्ट्रीम वो सेंटर हो लाइक as i said earlier and i reiterate my point that since we are we, demographically bhi hum log zyada log nahi hai we are hardly around 2.5 to 3 million people so uh, if we open it for for the provincial setup if we open ourselves if we accept it this, this is going to this, this is going to have a severe repercussions for the local people kyunki first 
we are economically dead sound, not dead sound. Secondly, we are not that politically mature, politically developed. So what will happen? It will open the doors for the people who are in people of influence, people of resources to come to Gilgit Baltistan, becomes local fight elections, and we are going to be minority in our own region. So there, the problem is we are not united on one point agenda some unfortunately there is a there is, they have just infused this you know fear or ya kya patriotism ke apne hakook ke liye bologe to it means uh, speaking for your rights in gilgit baltistan means speaking against the pakistani state pakistani interest no it's not speaking against pakistani interest but unfortunately unfortunately people are so scared they do not want to talk pakistan kuch bhi de de hame manzoor hoga but there are people like us decent voices who are considered like uh, gaddars or whatever but we do not want that we want an independent autonomous government in partnership up with pakistan not like in independent we're not aiming any separatist agenda or nothing we just want our interest to be safeguarded that's it thank you so much uh, for explaining it and giving uh, context and background to it anyone else who would like to have a question uh, please go ahead unmute yourself i have a question this is farhan do you hear me yeah okay thank you uh, so i have a question with adi marvi that she actually alluded also about the women rights so even with the ideal condition where we have civil supremacy looks like we have a center right party pmln will govern and on top of it they have a best buddy mulla fazlur rahman always there what do you think uh, women rights and progressive women will sit in, in this whole scenario Should I go ahead? Yeah, please. Any? I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, this this is an uh, it is an important question, and um, I think I tried to uh, uh, to address it in a very uh, small window that uh, that I was allowed to avail. Uh, but uh, and and justice cannot be done in few minutes. Uh, answer to this question. Um, but I would just like to. uh to emphasize once again that it's not about women's rights it's about democracy itself uh what democracy is democracy without uh without uh, half the population's uh interests being addressed um so when i said that i would rather be an ambedkar uh then uh or bhagat singh then uh, then gandhi or jinnah or nehru it was Uh, because their pop, uh, their politics uh, did not take into account the uh, the pressures of the class stratification as well as the intersectionality of uh, of uh, of other identities within those classes um, and uh, it would be too much to expect from pakistani uh, politicians to actually understand the intricacies of those uh, um those concepts uh, but it is our responsibility to keep emphasizing to keep highlighting the need for uh, for pakistan's political culture to be secular uh, to be fundamentally based on equality and social justice and social justice is not possible unless you allow uh, all the uh, the the oppressed minorities women included i'm Uh, i'm calling them a minority in terms of their political and social power um not uh, not so much uh, as per their number uh, so uh, i think it's uh, it's not a favor to women to include them in rights or the feminist perspective it is actually a uh, uh, part of your fight for democracy i mean uh, i i as i said that uh, it 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 has become it has been for long a men's club uh, and you just you you cannot by going uh, towards so called democracy uh, the way you have been going you can only make a pakistan and an india you cannot achieve uh, a socially just society uh, so in in order to achieve that you'll have to have the feminist question 
uh, when you talk about all right will not get i mean it's less glamorizing it, it's less less uh, glamorous to uh, to talk about feminist angles but it's more glamorous to actually talk about hardcore politics hardcore mainstream politics to to uh, to give your opinion about how apc went and uh, how the military establishment is uh, oppressing uh, well who who it is oppressing um, i mean uh, we are included in that women are included in that so it is it is very glamorous to actually being caught up in that kind of discourse but people like you and me we have a responsibility to keep pursuing this line of argument that i have just posited um and uh, as you have mentioned uh, you have pointed out the the dilemma that we are facing when um, malana fadur rahman has been asked to lead the pdm that we are required to cheer um um i would do so with a very heavy heart although uh, i also understand that be it nawaz sharif or any other leader they are as patriarchal as uh, a, a religious looking um, or religious sounding uh, molana fazlur rahman is uh, but the added problem is that molana fazlur rahman's constituency which is unfortunately a um, big overwhelming majority in this country it is penetrate it has penetrated in every other political party as well that constituency does not even want to hear the word liberal or secular uh, or or inclusive um while the constituency that votes for pakistan people's party or for example awami national party um uh, or pockets of pml and even they actually are being lured towards liberal politics more and more as they are facing the operation uh, so uh, so um you know being uh, being a bilawal zardari for example or being a nawaz sharif and being at the head of the table uh, makes me more hopeful than molana molana fazlur rahman being at the head of the table um but as i said i do understand uh, completely you know feminists are not uh, divorced from the realities and the ground realities of the and the political pressures um uh, that that uh, uh, that uh, politicians and political society in pakistan is facing uh, and that is why we do understand why it is happening and why some of us have to support that and we are actually ready to support that but not without constantly reminding that it is not that serves us that is uh, i don't think uh, anything is uh, less glamorous in doing that elections in pakistan they are shame elections uh, we only uh, look at the pollings but the pre poll and post poll rigging is the main thing which has to be addressed number 2 i'm going i'm from sindh so i'm going to talk about sindh sindh and balochistan have systematically been robbed by changing their democracy demography since the inception of pakistan we have been practically colonized and i call them settlements have been established in pakistan and sindh and karachi especially we have lost all the cities we have lost majority in all the cities and now these uh, new settlement like uh, recently they have uh, taken over or at least through the presidential uh, order uh, this uh, uh, annexation of the islands of sindh and the establishment of these uh, this uh, defense housing societies currently they have an, uh, taken over about 44000 acres of land on the side of super highway and these people are going to come from other provinces and they are going to disbalance the demography of sind and we strongly protest that and this should be included in sat that these uh, islands should not be annexed and these uh, uh, dhs which have been developed to bring the people from outside the sind and to basically change the demography of sindh and it has happened in balochistan and especially in sindh so that issue is very very serious and once sindhis are converted in minority then we lose complete control of sindh so that should i think this is very very serious for sindhis and that should be addressed in our session too or in a meeting thank you thank you so much thank you so much and uh, we would like to uh, wrap the session and uh, extend our uh, dr takia uh, someone uh, answer this uh, my
sorry, we are going to, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, we are going to uh, uh, wrap it up and we have noted down your question about send and pre and uh, pre poll rigging and uh, post poll rigging. So we are writing it down and we'll come back to it at the end of uh, the day. So I would like to now pass on the uh, mic to uh, Taha. So uh, from there it would go uh, and we will start the second session. Thank you so much. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.